I'm going to say people won't like it. A better Malcolm X performance than Denzel. Quality film. Let's start there. Quality, quality movie. This is a film that I had been waiting for for a long time. You know, I mean, the moment that it was announced, I was like, oh, this is a... Because I remember when it was announced. And when I just saw the synopsis and the story, I said, this is actually quite an interesting concept for a film. Obviously, it's based off a play by Kemp, Kemp, Kemp Powers. But I'd always been interested in this film because I just think it's, it's an interesting idea of, like, you know, what would a conversation be like with, with four of these guys? Because they obviously did meet, but nobody knows what they talked about. So, you get Kemp Powers, okay, we know that we met. We know that they met. What kind of easy conversation would these guys have? Um... But straight off the bat, um, this is a quality. Because, you know, you can always tell when a film is special. There's always a point where you say, ah, this film is special. Because obviously, you know, it starts slowly, tries to introduce you very slowly into the characters. Then it just hits a certain point where you're like, oh, okay, it's, all right. This, this It's that movie. It's that kind of move, movie, man. And, um, I, okay, let's just even start first with Regina King. Do you realize that she is the voice of both of the main characters in, in Boondocks? Do you also realize that, you know, um, what's it called? In the film, I've forgotten the name of the film, the film with um, Barry Jenkins, um, based off the Mr. Bolden book, like, she won an, an Oscar for that. So, amazing actress, actor, actress, iconic, iconic voice actors, voicing two iconic characters. And I think she's an amazing director, because... For a directorial debut, this is some pretty exceptional stuff. Some pretty exceptional stuff. As in, there is a, a flashback scene in this um, relating to Boston. Involving, of course, um, Sam Cooke and Malcolm X. That's just in terms of directing. You know, the logistics of directing. And now she just was able to put that scene together from a technical point of view. I'm like, oh, damn, the, it's just crazy how talented um, Miss Regina King is. Just absolutely amazing. But I just think you'd have to start there because this is for a directorial debut with such an important subject matter. And it's an ensemble. You know, because you know what people always say is, okay, you know, if you start to do a debut, just make it easy, simple story and so forth. Yes, it's, see, this is difficult because it's minimal low location and it's an ensemble. So you're having to really go for a back and forth, back, back and forth, which is why it does help. This is what she actually said herself that it helps that she's an actor, because this is this is such a character led piece, rather than low low location. It helps us really get the best performances from from the actors. And, and let's let's talk about the actors. Let, let, I'm just going to say it's off the bat right now. First off, because I want to get their names right. So I think this guy from Canada and this kid Eli Gorey completely lubricates um, Will Smith's performance. Gives a much better performance than Will Smith. You know, like, obviously, there, there are times where, you know, he sort of slipped here and here and there, because obviously, you know, I think this might be his first sort of major film role. But for a major film from him, it is a great breakout role. You know, and... Because for me, I've always said, you know, Will, Will Smith wasn't good. Will Smith is not a good actor. Okay, Will Smith is a, is a superstar. Hence why Will Smith's best performance was in Men in Black. But Will Smith, even when I saw Ali, I was like, it's, it's Will Smith trying to be Muhammad Ali. Whereas that? It's Eli Gorey became Muhammad Ali. You see, one guy became Muhammad Ali. Another guy is just trying to imitate Muhammad Ali. which is Because Ali was, oh, this is Will Smith, the guy, Will Smith, the star, trying to be like Muhammad Ali. But Eli Gorey was like, no. Eli Gorey doesn't exist yet. I am completely Muhammad Ali here. So I just thought that was a, it was just seeing how he got the accent, the mannerism, the kind of aura of Muhammad Ali, I just think was amazing to, to, to see. Aldous Hodge, who I'm a huge fan of, and Eagle Eye people will maybe recognize Aldous Hodge because he was in um, Die Hard with Avengers, Die Hard 3, because he was very young there. As Jim Brown, very good. He was real good. And he has a very key, important scene with Malcolm X. When it was just him and Malcolm, 
that's actually one of my favorite scenes in the film was the conversation that he had with, with with Malcolm. But I just thought the way that he played it, the way he just kind of got the heart and sort of, of Jim Brown was what was key because he was the most silent one. And I think that is always a very difficult role to play where you don't say much. You have very few words, but the words you see are very important. So he's the silent but deadly type in this. So I thought he did a really good role. And I've always just been a fan of Aldous Hodge. And I think he's a guy that deserves more roles. He was also in um, Black Mirror as well, in a very interesting episode of Black Mirror. Um, Leslie Odom Jr., Sam Cooke, quality. Quality, quality, quality. Amazing. Because I don't really... I've just heard about Sam Cooke. Now, because I've heard of his um, songs, R like, because his role in this was... He he had probably one of the most int he I think he ha yes he had the best arc in the film. His arc in this film he he literally had a very interesting arc from where he was at the beginning of the film and where he ended. His arc was super super interesting and I thought Leslie Odom Jr. did that really really well. So he was one that so oh, because I didn't think that I thought it would be much more about Ali. Malcolm X, maybe um, Jim Brown, but yeah, no, just Sam Cooke from his story was key, and I'll explain that. I'm gonna say Kingsley Ben Adair, you know, Kingsley Ben Adair, who actually um, grew up near where I sort of, you know, live. Um, I'm gonna say people won't like it, a better Malcolm X performance than Denzel. Said it, a better. Malcolm X performance than Denzel. I know people will call me crazy, people will call me mad, and say, whoa, whoa, that's sacrilege. But you see, we have to be honest. We love Denzel. Of course I love Denzel. Denzel is 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 blob is is fl is, is, is flipping an amazing man. Um but I've and I've always said this that it was just Denzel being Denzel. And for me, from looking at tons of interview footage of, of Malcolm X, looking at him on interviews and everything. I always felt that it's still a good, damn good acting performance, but I don't think he sort of embodied Malcolm X with regards to his mannerism and the way he put himself across. Because I just think that, again, look, for me, studying acting, doing acting and so forth, I always think that you have to have a balance when you play someone that is real. It's a balance between giving a performance, and that comes from me giving a performance, but also trying to get the energy of who you are playing. Again, as I look at what Forrest Whitaker did with Idi Amin, look at what um, Philip Seymour Hoffman did with Capote, where they're giving a performance, but also the kind of sweet signs of acting is how do I get the voice, the movements, the mannerism, the characteristics, and so forth to try and make this the... Because again, cause that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a key thing. It's like the tricky thing is you want to have is a balance between you, you don't want to you, you don't want it to become imitation you have to give a performance so hence why your talent as an actor is where the performance comes through but at the same time you also have a responsibility to be like okay like i've got to study who this guy is how he moves how he he walks how he does his eye movements his mouth movements are there any kind of particular intricacies or idiosyncrasies or mannerisms that he has let me try and take those not odium them, but just you know, sort of take those to try and so for the audience member, they're like, wow, he's that dude. And I just felt like Kingsley Ben idea, like I think for him, it's you could tell that he really studied Malcolm X. And it felt as if it was more closer to a Malcolm X and everything. Because I think Denzel leaned more on the performance. Because we know that when there's one performs, nobody can touch him when it comes to performance. So I think for Kingsley Ben Adi, I think it was like, yeah, I have to give a performance, but I think he focused more on what, how would Malcolm react in this situation? How would he talk? How would he get angry? How would he be re 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 reflective? How would he react? How, how would he interact given this certain situations if guys came to me? And I just thought the job that he did was on a technical level was top notch freaking top notch but i think with one of what i say with these films and everything people say oh the director the actors the actors the director the key thing that people always miss out is the script the script is the bible you can have the greatest director in the world and the greatest actors if the script is trash it's 
all they can do. Like, remember when they were interviewing Al Pacino? And people said, oh my gosh, Al Pacino. Like, they were talking about Al Pacino and Scarface. Oh my gosh, Al Pacino, that's one of the most iconic roles. Pacino says, thank you and everything, but please also praise Oliver Stone. Because I was merely just um, saying the words that Oliver Stone wrote down in Scarface. Yes, the way I said them was exceptional, but those words, I didn't come up with those words. I didn't improvise any, any, anything. I, those words came from the brain and the creative and imagination of Oliver Stone. So for this film, Ken Powers said, said what's up. Ken Powers really said what's up um, in this thing because it was a really good script. And the beauty about the script was it wasn't like, oh, right, 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 right. Oh. It, it wasn't black and white. It was like, oh my gosh, we have to fight, you know, we have to do this against racism and so forth. Because I was reading an interview, and this is the best way to describe it. A private conversation put out into the public. Because certain things that were said and the discussions that we're having was, wow. This is the kind of conversations that you're having amongst black people and so forth in terms of economic power, um, responsibility for um, other black people in plight, what you should do, using your platform, how not to use your platform, and so forth. And the reason and why I like about this was that everybody was questioned. Everyone was questioned, specifically Malcolm X. Because I think in Spike Lee's Malcolm X, it's pretty much viewed him in a very positive light and so forth, which was great because you always see need, need, need that. But the reason I liked about this was there were it sort of gave a much more objective view on Malcolm X. So as I say, for me, I think Malcolm X is one of the most incredible people that has ever existed, 100%. Just the way that he thought, he's thinking, he was just psychologically, he was on a whole different level. Um, but I liked how Ken Powell said, okay, let's just have a much more holistic, wholesome 360 view on Malcolm X. Let's actually question Malcolm X and, and just, you know, critique his beliefs and so forth. And I thought that, that was great. But I just think the the beauty about this was how Ken Powers, Regina King as well, was were able to make a conversation between people so exciting. You see, I compare this to another film that I watched, uh, Ma Rainey's Bottom, the one with, um, oh gosh, with, um, basically the one with Vala Davis and Chadwick Boseman. Again, limited location, but I found that very, very boring. This again, limited low location, but it was much more exciting because I think for Regina King, she was able just to add a bit more spice and a bit more silk and a bit more dyna dynamism to a film that takes place in limited locations. So, because whereas Marini's Bottom felt like theater just on film, this felt like a film. Remember, this is based off a theater play, but Regina King made it feel like a film and not theatre, because theatre and the film are two different mediums. Um, but I just think the beauty about this was how you saw, like, a Sam Cooke, is what can you as a musician do to change things? Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown, what can you do as sports people to change things? And Malcolm X, what can you do as a guy who can use words well to change things? And I think the beauty about them is you see all the different aspects of how you can affect change. Malcolm X, you always need that guy who is the intelligence guy, who knows how to speak and who knows how to coin words together to inspire people. You need the Jim Brown and the Muhammad Ali because everyone loves sports. Everyone loves to watch sports. And what you can do as a sports superstar can be impactful. Look at the kind of things that LeBron James, Naomi Asaka are doing. And my goodness, music, the power of music, that might be the most influential thing because you make a great song that can emotionally affect people in a way far greater than any sports could. So... That kind of conversation of what, how these individuals can do things and the pros and cons of their platforms, I just thought was amazing. So, just to, like, for me, I literally don't have anything bad to say about the, the, the film because it's like, uh, I just, see, that's why I've just got to watch it again. Maybe I've got to watch it again and then maybe see, the, okay, did this slip and everything, but... Like, to be honest, it was better than I thought it would be. I thought, okay, this is going to be decent, but just... I think the thing that just surprised me was just how well-directed it was. The accomplishment of the direction on a technical level. Um, the quality of the performances. See, when you see the trailers, I find, but just the performances was, was... It was so good. 
And the chemistry that each of them had was so good. And the screenplay was so good. I was like, hence why I've got to watch it again. Like I said, no, okay, no, I've got to watch this film again. It's sort of similar to when I watched Reloaded for the first time. I was like, okay, this film is crazy. But isn't this crazy thing? Okay, let me go watch this again. And I watched it like five, six times afterwards. But yeah, um, a really good film. A damn, damn good film. Um, that I just think that, you know, everyone has to see. So, obviously, if you're black, you have to watch the film. 100% standard. If you're not black, you still should watch the film because it is extremely well made and extremely well acted. So, just from an artistic point of view and for someone who appreciates the arts, oh my gosh, it's a film that you definitely have to watch, man. Um, but, um, yeah, man, it's... Um, I, you just have to just go to Re- Regina King, man. What a talent. And I just think, for me, just f- from on a personal level, specifically in a world that really, really disrespects black women and so forth, I think it is so amazing that she's done this. Because, again, we kind of hold back and forth with regards to female directors. And for me, I've just said that the only female director that I, th- that I think is accomplished on a high level is Catherine Bigelow who is a quality, amazing di- di- director, what's called Point Break, um, Zero Dark Thirty, Hot Locker. She is a quality, quality, quality director. And for me, just films that other film directors have made, just for me, have not been anywhere close to the level of Catherine Bigelow. But I'm, you look at this film right now, just from a technical, artistic point of view, and just the way that it was executed, I was like, this is it. Like, as you're watching it, you're, you're thinking, look, okay, can I see any kind of like rookie mistakes, first time mistakes? But as you're watching, I'm like, not for a moment do you think that's okay, yeah, this is okay, like a woman directed this or a rookie directed this or this is a first time director. You're like, no, oh, no, this is just like a film. <laughs> you know, so you forget that. You, know, maybe you, you don't see any kind of awkward transitions, no awkward cutaways, no awkward framings or so forth. Because sometimes you can tell, oh, that thing didn't really work. It's just smooth. It's just smooth. And there is just a nice rhythm to the way that everything flows. Um, and I just think as well, it really helps that she's an actor. But even if she is an actor, as I said again, that comes from performance. Hence why the performances were so strong because Regina King, as being an actor, knows how to, knows how to have her shorthand and say those things that an actor needs to really say, aha, boom. Even for me doing like my films back in the, in the day, I rely upon the director saying, bro, I, I can see my performance. I need you to tell me that, okay, this is what you need from me in this scene. You need more of this, you need less of this, so you can get the best possible performance. Um, but if you, if you put that to one side, just from a technical point of view in terms of framing, um, going from scene to scene, you know, the editing process, you know, knowing what to cut, what to keep, and just um, pace it. That is a director thing. You know, that doesn't come from acting. That is a pure technical thing that, like, a Scorsese or a Spielberg will, will are, are fully vested in them being non-actors but amazing directors. So, yeah, man, I mean, as I said again, look, I don't need if a, a film doesn't have validation because it gets an Oscar. Crash. Crash has an Oscar. Okay. Um, which I've forgotten the name of them, the the actress in L.A. Confidential, who won the award over, I think it's Gillian Anderson, who should have won in um, Boogie Nights. I've forgotten the name on it. She was in um, Batman, Tim Burton film. So they gave the Oscars to Bricks. Okay, they gave the Oscars to Bricks. David Fincher still doesn't have an Oscar. Ridley Scott still doesn't have an Oscar. Stanley Kubrick never got an Oscar. Um, gosh, what's the, what's the name of that guy? Alfred Hitchcock has never gotten an, an Oscar. So they are Peter O'Toole. Never got, got, got an Oscar. So there are legends out there that have never got an Oscar. Lauren, Lawrence Fishburne as well. So an Oscar is not needed to validate this, but it would be hard-pressed to find any films better than this. You know, just from a quality point of view. So yeah, man, um, for me, bro, and now I've got to say this again, I've got to give this a, a tier one. Tier one for me. For me, this 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 is a tier one rating, man. Absolutely amazing, amazing, superb, really good. And I was surprised that it was this good. 
I'm surprised that it was this compelling and this accomplished and this refined. So, one night in Miami, full on quality. Guys, remember to like that vid and to subscribe. One. Become a Half Hope Sort member and gain access to exclusive videos and also the chance to watch films, anime, or different videos with your boy HH exclusively. Just click below on the join button to join in and become a Half Hope Sort member to gain access to these perks. Just click on the community icon over here to view the new members only posts just for you.